Hello, I'm Pastor Dwayne, and this is my beautiful bride, this great gift of God in my life, Miss Cameron. And we come personally here to invite you into one of our live services. From time to time, we like to broadcast the live service. Cameron and I love to sit here and teach you the word and communicate with you on this level. But some of our viewers contact said, man, we just love when you preach mm -hmm. and when you stand in the pulpit and the anointing comes through. So today we're going to join one of our live messages that we've preached recently. And I know and believe that God's going to use it greatly in your life. And it'll be an encouragement to you, strengthen you in your walk. And I pray God that the, the, the anointing of heaven will come through this screen Amen. and touch your life as he touched many lives in this service. So join us today in this live broadcast of a message that God has given me. Hope you are blessed. What a week. Many, many of you were blessed last weekend with Apostle and Prophet Luke Holter prophesying into your life. Many of you received just in a matter of days, answered prayers, supernatural breakthrough. And <clears throat> in the midst of all of that, the enemy continues to strike. And I think about just this week and all that's happened. We pray for the poor, precious pastor in Nashville, Tennessee, and his wife, I can't imagine losing my nine-year-old daughter to this demon Amen. and the other children in that school and the three adults. Listen, you don't have to have anything beyond common sense to understand the condition that this nation is in with the leaders we have when they are taking up for a demonized murderer I don't care if you're trans, I don't care if you're straight, I don't care if you're red, yellow, black, white, brown, or purple, purple, purple. You're a demonized individual when you radically take the life of these precious, innocent little babies. And we've got to call it for what it is. It's demonic. It's not sick. It's not mental illness. It's demonic. And however that person identifies has nothing to do with what they did. I don't care if you're a right-wing fundamentalist, Baptist from a nut job church in the Midwest. <laughs> You're demonized. Yes. And if we do not get this nation back, yep. then it's only going to intensify and get worse. Yes. Many of you are seeing what's happening in Israel. What you see, and the Lord had me prophesy this, if you remember last year sometime, as goes Israel, so goes America. And I prophesied to you that they would put Netanyahu back in office. Yes. And he had to be put back in office. And you know why he was put in office? Dr. Caldwell is certainly more of an expert on this than I am. He just got back from Israel. But let me tell you why they put him in office. Because the millennials of Israel were sick and tired of demonized, radical extremists murdering their children. And they knew that Netanyahu would keep them safe, that he would bring the law, the rule of the law, and he would keep the law. And they, it didn't make any difference if you were a left-wing liberal of Israel or if you were a radicalized Muslim or Arab or whatever you claimed to be, that there was a law and the law was meant to be kept. And so the millennials of Israel woke up and said, we're not going to have our children terrorized and murdered anymore. And so now you have, in Israel, you have baby boomers, the generation just beyond mine, just like the baby boomers who are in charge of America right now, who came through the 60s and the 70s, bought the liberal lies of radical universities, and Israel suffered the consequence. And so you have got a whole bunch of people in their 60s and 70s who said they're going to outlaw this and that and something else. It's really over the fact that Netanyahu is putting judges in place who will actually enforce the law. That's what the protest in Israel is all about. And if you think for a moment they're going to have civil war, then you need to think again because I promise you that government will stop it. 
They won't act like our mamby pamby, Caesar milk toast spineless leaders. They will stop it. And so what you're seeing is you're seeing a few hundred people, maybe a thousand, few thousand, who have a voice while the millions in Israel sit back and are quiet because they want justice. They want law and order and they want safety. As goes Israel, so goes America. We're going to get a grip on this government. God Almighty is hearing the prayers of his people. But when we do, but when we do, that group in America is going to lose their mind again. And it's not going to be civil war because we're going to stop it too with prayer, with prayer and perseverance, not with violence. We pray, just you join me in praying this week that the right wing radicals in this country won't lose their mind on Tuesday and do stupid stuff. That's just as wrong as what the left is doing. We don't win and we don't take this nation with violence. Jesus said, Peter, put your sword up. Those who live by the sword die by the sword. But I find it interesting, and I didn't come up with this, and I don't have permission to use all of it, but I'm going to use just a little piece of it. I haven't talked to this gentleman to have permission to use his name or say who said it. I'm, I, it's not original with me. But I find it interesting that the president was indicted on the day that Jesus rode into the city of Jerusalem on a donkey. You understand who the jackasses are in this country, right? I can't say any plainer than that. Well, you're just, you're just not tolerant. You know, you're a preacher up there acting like, let me tell you something. If you think when Jesus comes as the lion of the tribe of Judah that it's all going to be butterflies and snowflakes, you need to understand something. He's coming with a rod of iron to rule the nations of the world. Well, I just... That's just hate speech. No, it's not. It's love. Justice is love. Amen. You want your nine-year-old to be murdered by a radicalized, demonized person? Because it's going to intensify in this country. I pray for all the people. I do. I love, I love everyone. I love the people who are confused about who they are. And if they could get an identity in Christ, they would be healed. But we're not going to tolerate our children being murdered. And I find it interesting that Mr. Trump was indicted by the donkeys on the day Jesus rode one into Jerusalem. And I find it very interesting that when he's arraigned on Tuesday afternoon, it'll be the exact time that Jesus was arrested. Now, I'm not saying he's Jesus. I hope he finds Jesus. He needs to know Jesus if he doesn't. But I pray that through this ordeal, the president, and I call him president because he still is. Yes. I pray the president will understand that he moves and breathes and has any purpose in being only for the sake of Jesus Christ and his kingdom. Yes. Not for Republicans or Democrats or you or me. He needs to come to Christ in a way. If, and I'm not saying he doesn't know the Lord. But I'm saying he needs to be surrendered by the power of the Holy Ghost in his life to be an instrument of love, righteousness, and justice. But what a week. And then the storms came through to try to bring devastation. And we just thank God that so many people were spared. But we pray for those who weren't. I mean, if you just stop and think about it, we've not had very many weeks in our life quite like this. And I was telling Cameron yesterday, driving from watching a grandchild play baseball, I said, you know, God's long-suffering, and aren't we glad he is? God's long-suffering. But you need to mark it down. You need to mark it down. He will have his say in this nation. That's not the sermon. That's not what I'm preaching on. I didn't plan to say all that, just to be honest with you. But um, there's hope. As a matter of fact, Cameron prophesied on Thursday. She prophesied. She said, this action 
by the radical left against the president is going to flip the switch. I don't mean in a bad way. I, I, listen, I'm not talking about violence and rioting. I'm not even talking about protesting. Just stay home and don't. I mean, it, 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 I'm talking about waking people up. Because if they can do it to him, they will do it to you. They sentenced a man this week to 10 years in prison for putting nasty memes or mimes or whatever they're called, I'm not familiar with that, on Facebook about Hillary Clinton. He just put some stuff on Facebook making fun of Hillary Clinton and he got 10 years in prison. Ladies and gentlemen, that's communist Russia. You don't agree with us in our narrative, we'll lock you up. Well, they can't lock all of us up. Just let them try. Well, anyway, let's get in a lighter mood. Hallelujah. Jesus is risen. And we'll celebrate Resurrection Day next Sunday. I'm going to read from Matthew chapter 21. I actually was not going to preach on this. I was going to preach to you about first fruits. And the Holy Spirit this morning, as I was drinking coffee, said, I want you to preach the story of what we celebrate on this Sunday. Jesus on God's calendar actually rode into Jerusalem, like I said this past Thursday, but we celebrate Palm Sunday. It's called by many. I want to read from Matthew 21, then I'm going to go to Mark chapter 11. Matthew 21, if I had a title for this, the title for this would be Speak to the Mountain. Many people are facing a mountain right now after all these storms and everything that's taking place. Our nation's facing a mountain. Everybody say, speak to the mountain. Speak to the mountain. And it will be removed. <laughs> Matthew chapter 21, verse 1. Now when they drew near Jerusalem and came to Bethpage. The word Bethpage means house of figs in Greek. It's a fig orchard. At the Mount of Olives. Then Jesus sent two disciples, saying to them, Go into the village opposite you, and immediately you'll find a donkey tied and a colt with her. Loose them and bring them to me. And if anyone says anything to you, you shall say, The Lord has need of them, and immediately he will send them. All this was done that it might be fulfilled what was spoken by the prophet, saying, Tell the daughter of Zion, Behold, your king is coming to you, lowly and sitting on a donkey, and a colt, the foal of a donkey. That's Zechariah 9.9, 9, if I'm not mistaken. So the disciples went and did as Jesus commanded. They brought the donkey and the colt, and they laid their clothes on them and set him on them. And a very great multitude spread their clothes on the road. Others cut down branches from the trees and spread them on the road. The multitude who went before those who followed cried out, saying, Hosanna to the son of David. Now interpreted from the Hebrew perspective, that is, the Messiah is here. He's come to save us. That's what they were saying. Here's the Messiah, the Messiah, the Messiah has come to save us. And so blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, Hosanna in the highest. And when he had come to Jerusalem, all the city was moved. This word in Greek impl implies that there was an earthquake. That Jesus comes no longer as the rabbi with Shemekah. He's not just the rabbi that he's been for three and a half years with Shemekah teaching and rearranging the, the Torah and the teachings of Judaism. Je you know, if you hadn't read my book, Jesus the Rabbi, that's foreign to you, but he was a rabbi and he had a status called Shmeekim, which means he had authority. He was the only man alive who had the authority to interpret the Bible to the people. He was the only man alive that could interpret the Bible to the people. All the other rabbis and the Pharisees and so forth just taught what they had been told. But because he had two miracles at his baptism, he had the authority to interpret, reinterpret the Torah to the people. And what religion had done had squeezed them out. It made it impossible for them to know God, made it impossible for them to have love, mercy, forgiveness, and grace. And Jesus came and said, if you've seen me and you heed and abide by my words, then you know the Father. So Jesus brought hope. Hallelujah. Amen. And so... They're crying out, the Messiah is here. He comes now as the King of kings and the Lord of lords. And the city was moved. There was a, an earthquake. 
Why was, the, why was there an earthquake? The, the, the earth was testifying of who he was. And so the multitude said, this is Jesus, the prophet from Nazareth of Galilee. And Jesus went in the temple of God and drove out all those who bought and sold in the temple and overturned the tables of the money changers and the seats of those who sold us. And he said to them, it is written, my house shall be called a house of prayer, but you've made it a den of thieves right here. He says, the Pharisees are th criminals. They are rich aristocrats. You have to understand the Pharisees were not priests. They were rich men who stole the priesthood and the temple from the Levites, and they went into a relationship with the Roman government to oppress the people, and they used religion and the threats of martial law against the citizens of Israel, and they kept them totally oppressed with the threat and you can't get to God without us. And Jesus, right here in front of the whole world, says, these people are criminals. They stole my father's house, a house of worship. The word prayer is prosuke in the Greek. A house of worship. My father's house is a house of worship, but you've turned it into a den of thieves. He wasn't upset because they were buying and selling. They always did that here. He was upset because they had stolen the priesthood. And so the power of God was vacant. There was no more power. There was no presence. There was no anointing. There was nothing there in the house of God but religious ritual that was killing people. Yeah. And he drove them out. Now look at this. Because you have to understand, Rabbi Yeshua is going to do something on this day that's going to shift the kingdom and the way the kingdom of God operates forever. And immediately, verse 14, the blind and the lame came to him in the temple and he healed them. That's what should have been taking place all along in the temple. I mean, think about the Shekinah glory dwelling there in that place, the presence of God. They should have been able to come to the temple blind and without any man touching them see. They should have brought lame people into the presence of God and immediately their bodies be put back in total restoration of how God intended them to be, the presence of God that restores and renews but because there was no presence, there was no power. That's what's wrong in the church in America. Pastors across this country are too worried about being politically correct and too worried about being tolerant. There's no, there's no presence. And when there's no presence, there's no power. I'm preaching better than you're shouting. But the chief priests, when they saw these wonderful things, these miracles, and the children crying out saying, this is the Messiah, <laughs> they were indignant. That's what religion does. That's what religious people do. This whole ministry, every time someone got healed, they found a reason to be against it. Right? Well, you heal this man on the Sabbath. Well, you heal this woman of an issue of blood, and she's unclean, and you're a rabbi. She's not supposed to touch you. So they were indignant. They said, do you hear what these people are saying? And Jesus said, yes, have you never read out of the mouth of babes and nursing infants? You have perfected praise. And then he left them and went out of the city to Bethany and he lodged there. And in the morning he was hungry and returned to the city. And seeing a fig tree by the road, he came and found nothing on it but leaves. And he said to it, let no fruit grow on you ever again. And immediately the fig tree withered away. And the disciples were astonished and marveled at how the fig tree withered so soon. And Jesus said... Assuredly, I say to you, if you have faith and do not doubt, you will not only do what was done to the fig tree, but if you also say to this mountain, be removed and cast into the sea, it will be done. And whatever things you ask in prayer, believing, you will receive. Amen. Everybody say, speak to the mountain. Speak to the mountain. Jesus, now, let me help you understand the Bible. I mean the real Bible. I mean not what you've heard all your life. I want you to understand what the Bible actually says. He's a rabbi. He graduated from rabbinical school. Again, that's not in the Bible, but when he was baptized, he was ordained. That was his ordination. Two miracles took place, gave him shmika. So now, I can really blow your mind by telling you not only was he the most powerful religious leader, and I hate that word religious, but the most powerful spiritual leader in Israel, he was also probably the richest man in Israel. Y'all take a swallow and take a deep breath. It'll be all right. 
When the Magi brought gold, frankincense, and myrrh, they brought casket-sized boxes of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. His family lived for two years in Egypt off of that. At one time, Jesus had 70 employees on his staff. He had the richest garment in the nation. That's why they gambled over it when they crucified him. Jesus wasn't poor. Do you think that culture would have given uh, two half a hallelujahs for a man who was some poor guy? He had wealth and he had authority. Amen. The very thing that those people in charge right now in this country don't want you to have, wealth and authority. Because if you have the authority and you have the wealth, you get to be in control. Yes. This whole economic system right now is about to come crashing down on them because God's about to transfer the wealth of the wicked to the righteous. Yes. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Don't you worry about Wall Street. It's going to crash. Don't you worry about the housing market. Don't worry about the banks. They're going to collapse. But God owns the cattle on a thousand hill. Yes, he does. And he's given them to you. Yes. Hallelujah. Yes. I'm preaching better than your shout. I've never seen the righteous forsaken. Yes. So, if you look at Mark chapter 11... I want to read that passage, I want, not the whole thing, but I want to read to you from Mark chapter 11. Look at verse 22, and then I'm going to preach for a minute. Y'all are listening slow today. <laughs> Sometimes I make those disclaimers when I get up to preach so I can, you know, run people off that shouldn't be here. <laughs> you, think I'm, you think I'm laughing? No, people have already got up and left, okay? So there you go. This is not church for everybody. Amen. So Jesus answered in verse 22, Jesus answered and said to them, have faith in God. Everybody say, have God's faith. Have God's faith. Have God's faith. That's what the Greek says, have God's faith. Do you know God has faith? Sure he does, because he knows whatever comes out of his mouth is done. You have been created in the image. You are the God bearer. Psalm, Psalm says in I forget the number now, 60, 62 maybe. Psalm, the psalmist said, you are little gods. What did he mean by that? He meant that the order and by which God recreated this creation is the same order by which you create in your universe. You are totally responsible for what happens in your life, around your life, through your life. You have the power and the authority of heaven through your words to dictate what is allowed, what's not allowed, what takes place, what mountains are moved, and what enemies are defeated. It's up to you. Yes. You spend all your time praying to God to do something. He's like, I've already done it, and I put it inside you. Now it's up to you. Yes. Well, I have this going on in my, in my body. Why are you tolerating it? Well, I have this going on in my, my family. Why are you tolerating it? Speak to the mountain. Have God's faith. What is that? That if you say it, it's done. Amen. Now I have to understand that. Now you have to understand so providentially it's done. But in the providence of God, it might not be done manifest till next year or 10 years from now or 20 years from now. But you, you can know this. You got a prodigal child and God promised you that child would serve him. You can stop asking God to go get your child and start saying, God, I thank you that my child is serving you because you promised and I speak to that mountain of drugs and addiction and it is gone in the name of Jesus. Yeah. Have God's faith. What is that? That if you say it, it's done. Amen. Then he says in verse number 23, he says, for surely I say to you, whoever says, epo in the Greek, whoever, everybody say, I'm a whoever. <laughs> and whoever says, the word epo in the Greek is, is plural and it's past tense. In other words, whoever says what I have said. If you say what God has said to the mountain, what has God said? You've got 66 books of what God said. Yes. By his stripes I've already been healed. He sent forth his word and healed them of all their diseases. All authority in heaven and earth has been given to me and so I give it to you. 
So God said, if you say, Jesus said, if you say what I have said. Now listen, let me help you understand the Bible. Every time in the Gospels that you read, Jesus say, you have heard it said. How many of you have read that in the red letter? You have heard it said. You know what he's about to do? He's about to change the rules of the Pharisees. You've heard them say, but I say, and when he says it, it becomes a law of heaven because he's a rabbi with Shemekha. That's why they hated him. That's why they wanted him out. So when Jesus said, I say, it, it, this is a law of the kingdom right here. This is an immutable, irreversible principle established by Yeshua, the rabbi, the Messiah, the son of God. I say to you, whoever says what I have said to the mountain. Now look at your Bible. There's a comma and a quotation mark. Jesus stops speaking to the disciples. He's on the Mount of Olives. You've seen that famous picture of that golden dome, that shrine of the Muslims over there. The temple was just to the right of that. Jesus stops speaking to the disciples and he turns to that temple on the Mount of Moriah and he says, be removed and cast into the sea. Then there's a comma and a quotation mark. How many of you have ever seen that before? You thought he's talking to the disciples. He stops speaking to the disciples and he speaks to that mountain on Mount Moriah where the temple of God is and he says, be removed and be cast into the sea. And then he turns back to his... Thank you so much for joining us today for our live broadcast. I pray that you were blessed by the message that was brought to you by my husband. And I pray that this week will be an anointed week for you and be blessings upon you. And Cameron and I want to personally invite you to join us live and in person every Sunday at 1030 at 6702 TP White Drive, Cabot, Arkansas. We'd love to meet you, give you a gift, and thank you for joining us. And thank you for listening to this message from our live service. Till next time, we'll see you on VTN. Thank mm-hmm. you.